gracious God Almighty and power and grace and abundance, provision in every way, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we approach you again this morning. We delight in coming and entering into your presence in the name of Jesus, the one who died for us, the one who rose again, the one who is interceding at your right hand even now in our behalf and this dear brother's behalf. I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just bless Brother Brent as he opens the word, as he pours out that which you've poured into his heart. Inspire him, enable him, equip him in every way to just be an instrument, a mighty instrument in your hands this morning. I pray, Heavenly Father, that every hindrance, every distracting spirit might be banished from this place, that your power and your glory might be uh, mightily displayed as your provisions are made manifest and you're equipping your saints, your children this day. And bless us in this message, this hour of worship. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning and greetings in Christ's name. It is really a joy to be in front of each one of you today. And just to be honest with you, just within a couple hours of being here yesterday, I just felt the Holy Spirit coming down on my life and being released in my life in a new way. And it's a joy to walk with you so many times in life. And all of you know this, there's many times that we walk alone if we're really, truly walking on the path of Christ. And as I was here yesterday, and we've not even been together very many hours, I see many people that are walking on the same path as I am and are walking toward the throne of God. Someday we will all stand together in heaven. But today we have an opportunity to be together with each other. So I'm humbled to just be, there, be here with you today. This message has been burning on my heart for months. And to be honest with you, this past Wednesday... I was feeling so filled with this message, I was feeling like I almost could take a box and just go out in the local town and stand up and shout this out because it was feeling coming so strong in my life. And it was a speaking so much to me. I want to just uh, read from the passage of scripture that we've been pointed to uh, in Acts to give us a little bit of a sense of where we're going in this weekend. Acts 2, verses 42 through 47, I'm just going to read them quickly. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And next, we see in this passage the result of what they did, those four things that they did there. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men, as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people." And then it says here, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And the thought came to me in the last several weeks that if we would look at these four things that they did in this passage, and we ask ourselves at many times in our life, why don't we see the power of God and the strength of God coming down on our life? If we would look at these four things that they did, they continued in the apostles' doctrine, which we know was Christ's doctrine. And if we would continue in fellowship, and if we break to bread together and do the ordinary things of life together, and then binding that all together, where it says here, and they continued in prayer, if we do those four things, I believe that the power of God will come in our life, and we will see God poured out in our life in a greater measure. And it's not, uh, I can easily point to the passage before this passage right here. Just a little bit earlier in this passage, it was when they were together that the Holy Spirit was poured out on them. And we here today in this audience are the recipients of those, that pouring out on their life. The prayers from their life are still continuing in you and I's life today because the Holy Spirit came down and he lit a flame in each one of them. And that flame has gone out and gone off of generation after generation uh, from Christian to Christian, and we now here today, that flame has touched our hearts, and it's in our hearts, and it, that flame has anointed and, and is in our, our time, and we are the ones that are the ones that are carried to carry the flame into our generation of the Holy Spirit and of the fact that there's a God in heaven, and he's a God that is worthy to be served. And now I know you know the title of my message today, but I will just repeat it again. It's Encountering Christ in Prayer. And there's really uh, two parts to this message. There's, it's a very simple message in reality. There's a number one, if you are to encounter God in prayer, 
there is a cry that must go up from your heart. And if you are to encounter God in prayer, there is a second thing. There must be a preparation of your heart. And I'm going to be speaking on those two things. So what is that cry? What is that cry that must be in our hearts? And many, you may have guessed this already, but it's a cry that we see several times in the New Testament. And it's a cry that's very common if you start to think about it. It's, a, it's found in Luke 11, verses 1 through 13. And I'm not going to turn to that, but it's, it's a cry that you've heard before. The disciples, one of the disciples, and I believe he was speaking for the others that were with him. He came to Christ and he said, Lord, teach us to pray. And I find it very significant as I look at that passage that, he, that they did not ask, even though they had been with Christ many, in many situations, they had seen many things, they had walked with him daily. They asked Christ one question. They asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. They did not ask him, Lord, teach us to heal. They did not ask him, Lord, teach us to feed the 5,000. They did not ask him, teach us to do miracles. Teach us to cast out demons. They ask him that one simple thing. Lord, teach us to pray. And as I think about that, I believe in my mind that suddenly as they were there with him one day, the words that Jesus so often said where he said that those that have ear to hear, let them hear. Suddenly their ears heard and suddenly their eyes saw. They saw in front of them. This is a man that is just like us. We are a man like him. And this man that is on earth, even though he's God, he needs power with God. And that comes through prayer. And they saw his life over and over as he would spend all night many times. The Son of God spent nights together with God. He had to have that prayer. He had to have that power of God in his life. And they began to realize that he is demonstrating something that was for their life, that they could have power from God, that they could have the power of God in their life. And as I look at that, I remember struggling for years and asking God, okay, I want to learn to pray. Where is someone to teach me to pray? And I believe that the disciples ask it in the right way because one day as I was asking that to God years ago, crying out to him, show me where to, how to pray. And I was looking at books and, and I was trying to grow in that area of my life. And I was discouraged. And I said, who will teach me to pray? And finally one day God very, very clearly said into my life, he said, I will teach you to pray. You do not need another man to teach you to pray. And I believe that the disciples, when they asked that question, they asked the right way. They came to Christ. And he is the only person in our life that can truly teach us to pray. You must go to Christ himself. You may read some things from books that will help. You may have people around you that will point you to principles and paths. But the ultimate thing comes down to this. You are going to be learning to pray from the school of Christ himself. And you will learn to pray sitting at his feet. That is where we learn to pray, brothers and sisters. And it starts every day by asking that one question that the disciples ask. And it starts by saying, Lord, teach me to pray. And if that is your true desire in your heart, then I want to point this out. How much passion is there going to be in your heart for doing that? It really depends on how strong your desire is that you want to meet God and to meet the real God. And there's a, a passage in Mark 10 that I want to just point to you. I would, and I may not read this here, but I just want to describe to you what is taking place in this passage. It's a passage for a, where there was a man named Bartimaeus, and he did not have sight in his eyes. And we have no idea maybe how long that he had gone with this, but he did not have sight in his eyes. And he most likely had heard about Jesus of Nazareth, the healer, and had thought in himself, I can't see, I can't go to Jesus, I can't get healed. And one day as he was, but he had that faith in his heart that if he could, he could get his eyes healed. And one day as he was standing, as he was sitting there beside the road and he heard a commotion going on, he suddenly realized from those around him as he asked, and they said, Jesus of Nazareth is coming. And suddenly faith welled up in his heart. And I believe as he was there, suddenly all thoughts of anything else in his life left him. And as he was sitting there, suddenly he, we know from the passage of Scripture, if we read it, he began to say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And I want each one of you to just think in your own life what it would have been like if you had been in his shoes. How much passion would you have to ask? Ask for Christ to come to you. He might, he might have thought to himself, this is possibly the only opportunity that I'm going to have to see Jesus Christ. This is the only opportunity I'm going to have to have my eyes healed. And I've been walking in darkness for so long. And so he, he cried out, and it says he cried out even the louder.
louder, even though people around him told him, be quiet. He was probably getting kind of obnoxious because he did not want to lose Jesus Christ as he left, and he cried it louder and louder and louder. And suddenly, when Jesus did turn and come his way, those around him said to him, How, you know, hold your peace, you, you've gotten his attention. And then it says here that Jesus said um, to come to him, you indicated that he should come to him. And it said, and he casting off his garment. And when I think about what he cast off, when he cast off his garment, he cast off everything in his life that would have restrained him. If he had a few coins or anything that was just of temporal value, he couldn't care less about anything that he had had that day, any coins that he collected. His sole purpose that day and his sole thought was that he wants to see Christ because he wants to receive healing for his eyes. And I'm just here today to tell you that if you will pursue Christ, and if you will go after Christ with all of your heart like blind Bartimaeus, then God will answer your request. Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And as I was reading this passage in the last several weeks, I believe God poured out something in my heart that I am supposed to communicate to some of you in this audience. And it is for you that are children or that are under your parents' authority or those of you that may have just accepted Christ in the last years of your life and you do not feel like a mature Christian. This is what God is saying to you. You have a soul and I have a soul. And in God's eyes, those souls are equal value. There is not one of us that has more power with God than anyone else. It comes down to how much you pursue Christ. And if you will pursue Christ with all of your heart, you will find him. Jeremiah 29 says, and this was in the Old Testament to Old Testament, uh, to the children of Israel, it says, I will be found by you, saith the Lord. And if you will pursue God with all of your heart, I can truly tell you that you will find him. If we look at Hebrews 11:6, nothing is said in that passage about what age you have to be. Nothing is said in that passage about how long you pursue Christ or how long you've walked with Christ. Nothing is said in that passage about how long every day that you sit alone with Christ. And brothers and sisters, we shall not, we so many times try to add to what the scripture says. We shall not add anything to this passage. It simply says one thing. If you pursue him diligently with all your heart, you will be found by him. And it simply says that he will reward you. And if that is every single one of us, as we pursue Christ with all of our heart, he will reward him. He will reward us. There's a passage in Zechariah 3.10 that has, been, has meant so much to me over the last number of years. And it's a, a, a small, obscure passage, but it's a passage where God, through prophet Zechariah, says about a man, he says, Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? You and I, each one of us, are burning sticks snatched from the fire. We are snatched from the, uh, from the clutches of the devil. We are f- snatched from hell. And you know what? In opposite of that, God now has a hold of us, each one of us that is walking with him. And now we are the flaming sticks of God. He has snatched us. And we, are, we have the flame of peace and passion for Jesus in our ha- uh, hearts. We are now the burning sticks that are called to go forth in our generation. And in order to do that we must have that cry on our heart Lord teach us to pray and when I think about that what should it look like every day in your life this is what it's going to look like as you say Lord teach me to pray it's saying this Lord this spiritual screen in front of my eyes that so often I can't see Lord just pull back the veil that I can see the way that you see help me to see from your eyes and when we think about our ears we pray Lord teach me to pray that I can hear the voice behind me saying this is the way walk ye in it that we can hear, we want to hear for each situation that God leads us to. Lord, help me to know how to hear and to pray what you're wanting to be prayed for this particular situation. And then we think of our heart. Lord, teach us to pray. Oh, Lord, help me to just feel the things that are on your heart. Help me to feel the burdens that are on your heart. And with my eyes, as my tear ducts cry, Lord, help me to weep over the things that make you weep. And then we come to him with all of those things, and then we just say of our lips, Lord, oh, Lord, teach me to pray that I could pray forth your very own words back to you, Father in heaven, that I can have power with God and with men, that they can see the almighty God and that they can see all that you have for them and the great provision that has come to them from the cross. 
I'm here to proclaim to you every single day in your life as your head comes off the pillow, you need to ask that question of God, Lord, teach me to pray. As your church, as you get together as a church, as you come together and you bow your heads, you bow it together and together you say, Lord, teach us as a church to pray. We want to pray with a deeper anointing. We want to pray with a deeper authority. In every situation in your life, as you go and as you walk, as you're in places of business and as you come across people and as God opens your eyes to see the things in their life and oftentimes destruction in their life, you say to yourself in your inner man, you say, oh Lord, teach me how to pray for this person, for this specific situation. And as you open your ears to hear, God, I am telling you, God will pour out in your life. He will show you how to pray. And it's a cry that needs to go forth from your heart. Luke 18 has a passage of a widow that is very familiar to us. And it talks about a place, it talks about a time in her life. And this is just simply a parable, but how she cried out. And I'm just going to read this passage to you. And he spake a parable unto them. This was Jesus speaking. To this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, nor regarded man, And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, no regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him? Though he bear long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. And when I see that passage, two things stand out to me. Number one, she was crying day and night. And he's pointing out that if you will cry out day and night, that God will hear you by your diligence. He sees your heart and he will pour out on you. And the second thing he says in this passage that really stands out to me is he says, will he find faith on this earth? Will he find faith on the earth when he returns? And I believe that God is looking for people. And as he returns and as he looks down, he's asking the question, do you have the faith? Do you have the faith to ask me, to teach me to pray, Lord? And I just think, I was thinking last night as I was looking through my notes, I remembered back to a time in my own life when I was in my my early 20s. And I, I had walked with Christ for over 15 years at that point, and I just realized that there was still something missing from my life. I wanted more of God, and I just began to ask, him, ask God that question, Lord, teach me to pray. And that was the desire of my heart, with all my heart, and I began to spend days fasting before the Lord. And I remember at one point, and this was after several years, as I just kept crying out, God, I want more of you. There has to be more of you than I have. I will not give up. I want more of you. And one night, I came before the Lord, and I could tell that my health was actually being broken down because I, had spent, I didn't spend as much time sleeping as I needed. And I was not eating like I always should because I was fasting before the Lord and wanting to him. Finally, one, day, one night, I just knelt before the Lord and laid before him, and I just said, God... I will find you. And if I don't find you here on earth, I I will die trying to find you. I will find you. I want you so bad in my life. And I just want to tell each one of you, come before the almighty God of heaven. You will find him. I am an example of a person that has found Christ. And I love him so much. And I just want to proclaim that message to each one of you. You will find him if you search for him with all of your heart. And if that is truly your desire, then the part two of this message is for you. Last spring, as I was preparing for this and as I was asked to speak, I was not quite sure if this was God's call for my life. And as I came before the Lord one night and I just asked God, what do I have to say about encountering God in prayer to those that are in this audience? And as I looked and as I was praying, I felt God pour out three principles that he told me that I am supposed to speak forth, and that is what I'm going to be speaking about today. The three principles are this. Number one, if you want to encounter God in prayer, in prayer, then there needs to be a preparation that comes forth from your heart to God, and it has to be a daily preparation. 
And, those, and the three things that will enable that to go forward, to, that will now allow you to be prepared, is number one, think about this fact. We can only set man free to the degree that we are free ourselves. There has to be a separation in your life from the things of this world. And number two, we must come to God from a position of weakness. Every single time that we come in front of God, we come from a position of weakness. Anything that is a position of our own strength restricts God. We have to take all of our own strength and remove it. We must have the power of God. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And the power of Christ can rest upon you when you come to God in weakness. And then the third thing that I believe is a part of our daily preparation is that the, we need to stand and sit and kneel and play in the presence of God. And when we do that, we must always come as to the foot of the cross. It all comes from that great source of supply and that one time in history when the victory was won on the cross. And as I stand here before you, I was thinking to myself that I really stand in fear and in trembling because as I stand before you, I will readily admit to you in my life that I have not always walked in freedom. And I am a common, ordinary person, and I am a vessel that has at times walked in my own strength instead of in God's. And I am also a person that has been a vessel many times that came to the cross for the supply, but I also came with my own backup plan just in case God didn't work. And I come here to tell you today that in, it's a good thought to think to do all these three things, but in and of our own strength, we don't even have the strength to do these three principles in our life. The Holy Spirit will have to enable us to do these things in, in our lives. And so I come to you to tell you, if I do not want you to go from this uh, meeting together today and saying, well, this is something for some people, but I can't do that. I don't have the ability to do that. None of us, brothers and sisters, have the ability to truly do this. God will have to be our helper. It will have to be through the comforter, his Holy Spirit, that we were able to do that. And as I begin to share some of these principles and the principle of freedom, I want to read from you. I want to read to you from Isaiah 42, 6 and 7. Reach up your hand, each one of you, and reach up your hands with me to God and hear what his word is to each one of you out of Isaiah 42. I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the Gentiles, to open eyes that are blind, to free captives from prison, and to release from the dungeon those who sit in darkness. If it is a great calling to set men free, and God is calling each one of us to free from the dungeon many that sit in darkness. 1 Timothy 4.16, and let me just read this to you. This is a precious passage. Take heed unto yourselves and unto the doctrine, continue in them. And this was Paul talking to Timothy. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. And in the NIV version, it says, watch your life and doctrine closely, persevere in them. Because if you do, you will save both yourselves, both yourself and your hearers. 1 Corinthians 6, 17 says, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. The call to living a life of freedom is a call to separation from the world. It's a call of a separated life. It's a call of a clean life. John 3.3 3 says, And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. When I think of this principle of freedom and what it would really mean to be free, we sometimes don't truly understand what it means to be bound and until and we are bound. And years ago, I had an example that so illustrated to me the principle that you cannot set men free unless you are free yourselves. We had invited to our church a ministry that went throughout the world that went specifically with the task of freeing those that could not free themselves, that are being trafficked or in human slavery in many dark dark places around the world. And as that person was there sharing in front of us, 
there was a video that he said that he was going to show us, and he showed it to us in front, and I, as he showed it to us, I was in the back of the audience holding one of my daughters, looking and watching and listening to his presentation. And this video that he had was just a short clip, but he said, this is actual footage of someone that is being freed from slavery. They, they had gone in and into this house, and they opened a trap door, and I saw in front of my eyes people being lifted out of a dungeon that were trapped there, that were enslaved there. And as I was sitting there, and I was holding, or as I was standing there, and I was holding my daughter in my arms, I saw out of that dark pit being lifted out, I saw several children that were young girls, and suddenly, my eyes, I had never experienced this before in my life before. I felt in my spirit, I could not even think anymore. I was staggering, I was staggering as I was holding my child. I was so overcome with emotion because suddenly I saw the daughter in my arms transfixed over top of that picture right there. What would it have been like if my daughter would have been down there and had been enslaved and had all kinds of horrible things done to her? And I sank to the floor and I, I couldn't even help myself. And my daughter said, Daddy, what's wrong with you? And I just laid, I literally laid right there on the floor weeping before the Lord by what I had seen. This is how dark it is to be entrapped and enslaved. And we as a people, as we go forth and cry out to God, Lord, teach us to pray. We're crying that out because there's people that need freedom and it will need to come through our life because nobody in that uh, video that I saw, it had to have people that were free to be able to free people. Nobody down in that pit that was enslaved was able to free themselves. They did not have that power. We as Christians who are free and who are living free, we are the ones that go forth to free people. Exodus 19.6 says, And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a an holy nation. We're called to be priests. And every day as we come before the Lord, and especially as we come before the Lord in prayer, our cry of our heart should be, Lord, cleanse me. And as we're a priest before the Lord, we take the time to cleanse our life. And I often do it right in that first moment as I, as I bow my head, Lord, cleanse me in my life. And I ask God this question, is there anything in my life that is not as it should be? John 15, 4 says, ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. And let me ask you a question here today. Have you ever asked God what things he would like for you to remove from your life in order that you can rock and speak, that God can walk and speak to you in a greater way, free from distractions? And let me ask you this question again. What has God commanded you for your life that is different than others? Every one of us should be able to answer that question. What is the, the commands of God for your life? I believe that if we truly go to God and if we truly ask him, he will show specific things to us that he wants us to remove from our life. John 8, 36 says, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Ask God to point out anything in your life he would like you to remove and then be willing to do that. And it might be good things that he remove, remove from your life. You need to simply do what he says. And I'm struggling a little bit today whether I should share this or not, but I'm just going to take the chance because I don't want to draw any attention to myself. But years ago, I learned that there was things that God was calling me for my life that was different than other people. And many, many times, God did not, the others did not understand me. Even my fellow Christians around me may not have understood what God was asking me to do. But I learned that I had to live with a radicalness in my life. And I had to live with radical obedience, what God said to me in my life. And an example is from this past year. In January, many months before I was asked to speak here and before I was asked to do several things that I have been involved in this year, I heard the Spirit of God say to me one day in early January, he said, Brent, if you are to walk in what I have called for you this year, you will need to be very free from distractions, and you will need to be able to hear my voice, and something that will hinder you hearing my voice is that if you read news, you will be distracted, and God told me, Brent, you dare not read any news of politics this whole entire year, and I will confess before you that several times in that beginning beginning stage, about three times, I began to read the first few lines of a new story, and the Holy Spirit came down on very, very strong, and he said, Brent, I told you not to read those things. Do you want to hear my voice or not? Do you want to walk in the calling that I have for you or not? 
And I'm not saying that God has asked each one of you that thing to do in your life, but he may ask many different things in your life that is different than I have. And you must walk in those callings if you are to be the friend of God. There's many times in the past that God has said to me, as I begin to walk in, I lived for years as a single person in an apartment by myself, and as I would walk in the door, there was times God would say, food will be a distraction to you. You must not eat food tonight. At one point in my life, for months at a time, God actually he took music out of my life. He said, the only music you are to hear is when you walk in Sunday morning and praise the Lord with the other saints. All other music, I want just your time with me reading the word. And in order to walk with God during that time period, I had to obey that. I'm asking you today to uh, come to the altar before God at some point this weekend and ask God, what are the specific things that you have for my life? Matthew 5.23 says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there remember it, that thy brother hath aught against thee, leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come offer thy gift. And this is in the context of being reconciled to our brother. But I look at this passage, and I just look at those first lines where it says, Therefore, if thy bring thy gift to the altar, every time that we come before the altar of God, the cry should go up from our heart and say to God, What do you want me to change in my life? Is there anything today that you want to change in my life? And now I really can't go on and go to my next point unless I address one serious thing yet, because this goes with the principle of freedom. And it's the, it's the principle of sin. We cannot have sin in our life if we are going to be a free people. It's so very simple. All we have to do is as we come to the altar, we need to just confess before God, Lord, I'm a sinner. And is there any sin in my life that has not been confessed, that I have not thought of? And God will immediately clear that before you, between you and him. It has been paid for. It has been bought and paid for on the cross years ago. It's already paid for. We just need to simply confess it. Revelation 12, 10 says, And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And the reason sin is so serious in our life is because as we come to God in prayer, if we come to God with any sin in our life, then the devil has an inroad to hinder our prayers. If you study prayer, you will realize that prayer operates in the legal realm. It is like coming before a throne, or it's before, like coming before a judge. We come before Almighty God, and we ask God, Lord, I ask you to work in this situation. But you know what? The dark forces are there also. And if they can find anything in your life, that they can legally say to God, you may not work in this life because Brent has this in his life that is not in tune with you and is not in line with you, if, and I say that of myself, but of each one of us, as we come before God, if there's something in our life that can hinder our prayers, you better believe that the dark forces will try to use that to every advantage. And an example from scripture that shows this very plainly was in the Old Testament as the children of Israel went to conquer in the land of Canaan. And at first at Jericho, they had a very great victory. But we know as they went on, as they went to Ai, there was a man that was named Achan, that had previous to this, had stolen something that he should not have. God had said, don't take anything into, from the city that you are conquering. You must not take anything. You must destroy it completely. And he did not listen to the word of the Lord. And he hid that thing. It was like hiding a sin under his tent. And I think to my, and we see from this example in scripture that they did not have the results that they re thought that they were going to have. They had destruction. They had many people that were killed. And I think to myself, what if they would have come back from that battle that they had lost? And they would just said to themselves, maybe we just need to pray a little bit harder. Maybe we just need to pray a little bit longer. We just need to dwell with God. We need to sit in his presence. You know what? They could have spent many, many days and many, many hours praying. And it would not have changed what was the reason that was blocking their prayer. Because Satan had a legal right to defeat them. He had a legal right to put a wall between the prayer that they had and what God wanted to pour out of them. They had to get that sin out of their camp before God could truly answer them. And that is how God works with each one of us. We must eliminate sin from our life in order that he can work in our lives to the greatest extent. And now I want to just come to point two. 
First, we have to have the principle of freedom in our life. And then the second thing is that we must come to God in our weakness. Hebrews 4, 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace and to help in time of need. And this seems sometimes like a paradox, that we come totally in weakness, but it also tells us to come boldly. But it is not a paradox. It is a, a passage that we need to realize. We come boldly in our weakness. Matthew 19, 14 says, But Jesus said, Suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. We need to have a heart of trust like a child. And there are many times that my children come to me, and it's very precious in my life when they say, Daddy, can you do this for me? And it's often things that they can't do for themselves. And just in the past couple weeks, one of them asked me to get something for her off of a high shelf. And it is a joy to me. And I know that they're weak and cannot do that thing that they're asking me. And I want to reach down, and I want to help them. And that is how God looks at each one of us as we come to him in weakness. He loves our weakness because he says, now I can work. And there's two examples that I see in scripture of people that came before God in their weakness. One came to God in, their, in his weakness, and another person came to God in his strength. And we can see the results from their life. The passage that shows someone coming to God in their weakness is in 1 Samuel 17, and it's David when he went to fight Goliath. And I've many times looked at this uh, passage and thought this is an amazing passage of scripture because David had a prophecy on his life that he was going to become king. He couldn't lose this battle. He, I don't know whether he realized it or not, but the prophecy had not come true. He couldn't lose that battle. It was he hadn't become king yet. He went with he could go with full confidence. But we know from this passage of scripture that there was people there as he said, "Why are you fighting this this heathen?" God will prevail. God will go forth with us. And so they, King Saul said, okay, I will allow you to go forward and fight this giant. And he tried to put his armor on him. And you know what David did? He refused that armor. He realized that that armor was a strength of man. He could not go to fight Goliath. He would lose if he was fighting with any kind of strength of man. He went forward to fight Goliath totally in his own weakness as he came before God. He went in his weakness and as you look in the passage, it says that literally, as Goliath was there, that David began to run toward Goliath. He ran full speed ahead, knowing that he was weak, but knowing that God was strong. And as I think of him there, as he was running toward Goliath, Goliath had a mind, and Goliath had logic, and Goliath had his own strength. And he said, logically, and by my own strength, I will win this battle. But as David came into that situation, he looked at Goliath, and you know what he saw? He saw behind Goliath. He saw all the hordes of hell. He saw the abyss. He saw all the demons of darkness. And as he knew that was behind him, he knew what was behind him. It was God, the almighty Lord of hosts. He was the one that was going with David as he went forth. And as he went there, I just imagined him as he took his hand and started swinging that slim, that sling, that just like it says in Isaiah, God will take hold of your hand, that uh, David had God reach down and take hold of his arm as he slung that, uh, that sling around, that stone that was a representation of his faith, went straight for Goliath. And you know where it hit? It hit right in his forehead, right in his mind, that mind that had what he thought was the strength of man that would conquer, but he did not conquer. He fell. The power of God came through David's weakness to fill, to fall that giant. And that giant was killed by the power of God and by the weakness of man. And in this passage, we learn from ourselves that as we come forth to God in prayer and as we cry out to God, we go in the same way. We go in our weakness. What is the Goliath that is in your life that needs to be conquered through weakness? It may be your marriage or something that is not in the way that you had planned for your life to come out. It may be a child that is in your life that is not walking with God, that is walking astray. It may be impossible situations in your life that you don't have any power to overcome. You will only overcome them through the power of God. You need to go with to God 
with your weakness. You need to take that sling and you need to take that stone of faith that God gives you and you need to hurl that and allow God to take hold of your hand and sling that stone and sling that toward that giant because you need to remember like David that you have the power of almighty God behind you but yet you come in your weakness to God. The devil may use intimidation, but if you will really honestly look, you will realize that he is simply shaking in his shoes because he knows that he is, he is conquered and his days are numbered. Samson is the person that I wanted to talk to you about, of a person in the Bible, an example from scripture of a person that came and should have come with the weakness that God put in his life, but instead, it appears as we read this stuff about Samson in scripture that he came in his own strength. Many, many times we see that God did put strength in his life. He was known as the strongest person that ever lived. We see many times that Samson went forth and he conquered, but he also had some great things in his life that were not free. He lived in sin. He was supposed to be a Nazarite. There was several, there was things that God had required from his life that were different from other people, and they were from the moment he was born. But he broke every single one of those things, and yet he would get up every day and he would shake himself, and he would go forth saying, I will conquer in my own strength. But one day that came to an end. He had dwelt in his own strength for too long, and as he stood up and shook himself, the power of God had left him, because it really was not, it was only God's power and suddenly he was dwelling in his own weakness. And we know the story that he was conquered and he had his eyes gouged out. And in that time period, God used that to work in Samson's life. And it's a powerful thing if we read one of the last things that we read about Samson in Judges 16, 28. And Samson called unto the Lord. And I believe that he was calling to God. He had finally come to minister before the Lord from a point of weakness rather than from his own strength. And it says, and, God, and Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me, I pray thee, only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. And he came in his weakness, and we know the story, that through the power of God and through the, the weakness that he now had in his life, he was able to push the pillars over and to once again fight for God's army and for God's, for God's anointing and for God's conquering of those wicked people. So we come as a weak vessel. We come before God as a weak vessel every day, knowing that it's not our own strength, but it's God's strength. Something that has affected me from years ago was a, a tape that I listened to that had the story of a man named Ken Jacobs that was a Bible translator to the Chamula Indians. And something that he said has stood with me for years and years and years. And he said that as he was translating the Bible, and at the same time, like all of us, he was dealing with his own life and his own inabilities to truly live up to all that God had for him. And he says that as he was translating the Bible one day, he suddenly was just brought to the cross and he just said, oh God, can I only sin? He wanted to do right, but yet he saw so many weaknesses in his life. And he said that God said to him right in that moment of time, he said, I'm glad you finally realized that. I've known it all along. And God knows each one of us. David in Psalms 103 says, For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. And that is a great comfort to us because God does know our weakness. And he knows that we have weakness. And we need to simply come before him and just admit it. We are a weak people. 19, Psalms 19 verse 14 says, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. We can only have the power of Christ rest upon, resting upon us as we come in our weakness. And then this just brings us to the third point that I believe God spoke to me months ago. And he just said this, we must come to prayer always as coming to the foot of the cross. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5, and maybe I'll just read that passage to you tonight or today. 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 5 says, 
And this was Paul writing, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. As we come to Christ, and as we come every day before him in prayer, we must come as coming to the cross. It is all his power in front of us. It it is all of Christ's power. It is none of our power. I read a story in the past year. We've been reading through the lives of great Christians to our children. And I read a story that so illustrates the power of God. And it was, I don't want to draw any attention to a person's life. I want to draw only attention to God. But this was a story about a lady that I had never heard of before named Irene Rebster Smith. And God called her in a dramatic way to go to Japan. And she worked in that place for her whole entire life. And as she was there, she began to build orphanages because she saw the the needs of young girls that were in that place. There was a lot of wickedness in Japan. And she began to go before the Lord and ask God what she could do to alleviate what she saw in front of her that was a great scourge and sin in the land. And she began to build orphanages for young girls. And she had an orphanage, and the orphanage that she was leading, it uh, came crashing to the ground one night in a storm. And they were saved, but it was not repairable. And so they began to build a new orphanage. And as I was reading that story about Irene Webster Smith, I I read something that just challenged me to my core. As she was building a new orphanage and a new place, and they needed water, and they had limited resources to pay for the water, for the drilling of the well, and for the orphanage. And as they began to drill, she hired a local well driller to begin to drill. In that time, they actually didn't drill. They, They dug their wells by hand. And they began to go down. They went down 30 feet. They didn't find water. And the the well driller reported to her, we haven't found water. And she said, keep digging. And they went down 60 feet. They did not find water. They went down 100 feet. And by now, the well driller said, this is a very, very deep well. This is deeper than any well in this whole area. And we still have not found water. We must move to another place. And Irene Webster said to him, she said, I am not to waste any of the Lord's money. We must keep digging. And he shrugged his shoulders in desperation because he was, she was not listening to what he said. She said, God will bring water in this well. And so he continued to dig. And he went down 132 feet. And he came to her with a smile on his face. And he said, now I know we must quit, the, dwelling, dr- we must quit digging this well because we have hit solid rock. And she said to him, and I believe it was faith, her faith in God, her strong faith in God, she said to him, well, praise the Lord, because just this morning I read a passage about how Moses, in the Bible, and the God that I serve, as Moses struck the rock, water came forth from this rock. So this is a confirmation that God is going to put water in this well. You're going to need to get someone drill through this rock as water can come in. And then it says in that book that I read, she said that she rode her bicycle off into the brush, and she said, said, God, I have just proclaimed your name before these pagan people, and will you please, by your power, show them your strength? Don't let me down, God. And the next morning, as they began, they brought a crew in that had to drill through that rock, and they were drilling and drilling, and finally she could not keep herself away from that well any longer. And she went over, and it says that the moment that she got to that well, all of a sudden she heard a person down in the well speak buttering and stammering. And they, she said, haul the rope up. And they hauled him up and water came in that well because of what I believe was the faith that she had in the almighty God and in the provision of God. And I, as I read further in that story, she came to another time, not a, many years later, where she came into a situation where she was desperate. And she went out in the middle of the night and knelt before that well, that well of water that she knew God had provided, that great provision of water. She knelt bound before that well and said, God, I need help. I need help. I need provision for this situation. I am in a desperate need. I have to have an answer. 
and you brought water in this well, and I believe that your provision is real, and you will provide for my situation. You will bring your provision into my life. And then she went back to her orphanage with her children and with her young girls and committed it to God, and within 24 hours, her cry and her prayer was answered. And when I look at that, I just think of each one of us as we come before God. We come before God, the almighty provider. We come before the well of great water. It is all of God and none of us. John 7, 37 says, in the last day, and this was Jesus speaking, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath saith, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And my question for you today is this. Is anyone here thirsty for more of Jesus? Is there a cry within yourself for provision, provision for a need in your own life or for someone else? Come to Jesus right now, the well of clean water, the well of great provision. We have a God that is a well of great provision. We have a God that will supply our thirst. As we come before God and cry day and night, Lord, teach me to pray. God will pour himself out and he will give us the provision that we are asking for. And I would love for all of us to just bow your heads before God and just think in your own mind as I read through my points again. There must be a cry that comes from your heart. Lord, teach me to pray. You must prepare your heart to receive God's anointing. And there's three things that you can do to allow that to happen in a greater way in your life. You can't set men free unless you're free yourself. You are called to a life of separation, free from all hindrances of the world. Come to Christ in weakness. Let no form of your own strength restrict his work. Come to the foot of the cross. Come in the name of Jesus. Come to the great provision of God. And just ask yourself this question. Are there any areas in your life right now that you are not living separated from the world? Are there any areas of separation that God has asked of you that you have not been willing to surrender and to obey? And as we're here in front of him, in the quietness of your spirit, tell God your heart that you want to do all that he commands you. You want to be known as his friend. And now just ask, I want to ask the question, are there any areas that you're walking in your own strength? Are you depending on your, your own mind, your own wisdom, your own ability to communicate, your own ability to live and move? Just confess right now before God your weakness and that you have maybe been depending on your own strength. Just confess that right now before God. Let him take away that burden of trying to live in your own strength. And then right now, as we just dwell in the presence of God, let us just come as to the cross, that great source of supply, that great source of provision. Like Irene Webster, let us just kneel before the well of God, which is the cross. Let us kneel before the cross. And as we're kneeling before the cross in our minds, let us just think about the blood that was spilled from Jesus Christ, who was nailed to that cross. And as that blood ran off of his body and dripped, each one of us is under that cross that has accepted Christ as our Savior. And that blood is washing away our sin. That provision that God made is washing away our sin. Come to the cross before God. That great cross of provision.
And now I'm just going to pray for all of us together that we can have more of that in our life. God, we just come before you. And Father, we come in our weakness before you. Father, we desire to set men free. And God, we desire to know and learn how to pray. Lord, we just come to you today as to the cross of great provision. And God, we pray that you would pour out on each one of us refreshing from the very throne of grace. And Lord, help each one of us to take what you give us and take it freely and come to you with joy this morning. Lord, we thank you so much for your great provision of the cross. And Lord, we just pray that each one of us, God, give us the strength to surrender our lives totally to you, to surrender our time to you, to surrender many times throughout our day as we're standing in front of the wash line, hanging up clothes, that we can surrender our lives to you and pray for our children. Lord, make them clean. And as we're driving to work each day, those few moments that we have of solitude, Lord, may we surrender those moments to you, that we can pray for our families, for provision, and for more of your Holy Spirit to anoint us for your work. And God, I just pray that we can each one, Father, help each person in this audience, Father, help all of us to find that secret place of prayer, those secret places that you have for us all throughout our day and all throughout our night, those secret times that we are in front of you. And God, we pray that you would pour out on us an anointing to pray, just like you taught your disciples to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. God, I pray that you would raise up from within this group a praying church, a church, God, that walks in the power that you intended for us, a church that does not hold back because we have a mighty God behind us. And we, even though we have many Goliaths and many giants in front of us, we have the power of Almighty God that is working and moving in us, and we walk forward in faith. Oh, God, when you return, I believe and I pray, God, that you will find faith on this earth. Find faith in us, God. God, allow that faith to grow and allow it to grow in my life and, each, and in each one of the brothers and sisters in front of me. And I just pray this prayer in the almighty name of God. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for your provision. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.